Hey guys, this is Mel, and I'm here to talk about the 100, episode 507, titled Acceptable Losses, which premiered Tuesday, June 19, 2018 on WCW. I'm recording about an hour after the episode has ended, so huge spoiler alert. If you haven't seen the episode already, please go do so first, then come back and see what I have to say about the episode. Otherwise, my other whoa, video reminders are up on screen. Take a moment to remind yourselves of those. I'm just so happy we don't have another hiatus because it's been new episode a week break, new episode, a week break, and I'm sick of it, so I'm glad that we're not getting that next week, so I want to dive right into this, going to try to do this in 15 minutes, let's start and talk about what happened in this episode, so timeline-wise, um, Bellamy states in this episode that it's been eight hours since the defection happened at the end of 506, um, so essentially it's the next day, um, between 506 and 507, um, and according to a wiki source, um, apparently, randomly, but it's the confirmed to be the year 2156 pretty sure that was due to the allegis files confirming some dates um, that raven went through in 503 uh, but thought i put that out there uh, but episode reminder i'm putting it down to the experimentations returning um and, and it's within one crew of all places right um, but the episode objective is the deactivating of the allegis eye in the sky was the main plan for this episode. So huge uh, breakdowns and storylines. Um, pretty much I have them set in two separate places. So we either have the, the two storylines happening in Shadow Val Shallow Valley or Eden, which is um, Echo, uh, Echo's Mer um, mission, whoa, and then Abby's addiction. And then second place being within one crew, and that is two storylines there with the whole uh, breeding experiments as well as with Maddie's training. So within, um, let's go to Shallow, Shallow Valley. So with that, we get um, uh, Echo's mission where she teams up with the Raven uh, to try to get uh, access to the system so that Monty can uh, look into the eye in the sky. Raven reluctantly helps Echo when it means riding out uh, her uh, sort of alliance with Shaw. Uh, and because of it, it has Shaw, or Shaw as a prisoner with the other defectors. And now with Abby's addiction, she's still trying to figure out a cure for the, the sick prisoners, uh, but her addiction's getting the better of her, and to the point that Kane tells Abby to make a choice, him or the pills. So there's that. Now with one crew, with the storylines, we have the first one being uh, uh, that um, Clark and Monty come across the fact that uh, one crew is trying to breed those sand parasites that we saw um, in 505, I believe. Um so there's that. We find out that Octavia knew about the breeding, yet she did not know that it was being done on live humans, uh, which is what Kara was testing out, or Kara Cooper was testing out. And we found out that Indra had no idea about this whatsoever. Uh, Octavia wants to um, turn the the sand parasites into a weapon of some sort. It's kind, of, kind of like a Trojan horse, essentially. Um, if they're able to survive in a living host, then they can send the host into the clutches of Allegis and then have the worms kill everything inside there. Um, before the uh, rest of one crew gets to the valley. Apparently it's supposed to work because the worms can't live in um, Shallow Valley for long for some reason. Um, I guess because of the, the, the I don't know, uh, the environment, the livable environment, and the habitable environment there as opposed to the inhabitable one in the, uh, in the desert. Um, so there's that. Uh, apparently, I don't know if I got this right, but Cooper, Car Cooper said that one defector got through to Eden and he they were part of the first set that um, fleed with Echo. Not sure if that's correct in what I heard, but that's what I thought I heard. So there's that. And moving with Maddie's training, she starts her training with Guy as a teacher. She joins the other kid, um, other kids um, taking the class and learning how to be warriors. Clark tells Maddie to not stand out, to not show just how different she is. Gaia supports this because she wants Maddie to keep a low profile so she can stay alive. Um, and Gaia swore to protect Maddie. She even shows her the flame to give her an idea of why she's so important as a true Nightblood. So there's that. But in the end, Octavia manages to promote Maddie to a soldier as well, I think second command possibly, or some higher ranking official, strategist or strategist or something, when she sees Maddie win her fight against Ethan, I believe, in the, the little uh, showcase they, the, the students were having for Octavia. So anyways, last moments of the episode show 
after confirming with Dioza that complete surrender is the only way that Eden will be shared between Allegis and Wan Crew, uh, Bellamy and Clark realize that Octavia needs to be overthrown in order to do that because she will not surrender. Um, so that's a shock. Maybe I shouldn't say Bellamy realizes he knows what Clark is getting at, though, with that statement. So anyways, moving on to tidbits, since there weren't really any new characters in this episode. Uh, but tidbit-wise, we do not see Murphy, Amori, or McCurry, who is set, who was mentioned to be missing in this episode um, by Shop. So there's that. Uh, also, we see Clark giving Jasper's letter to Monty that she found um, not long after Prime Fire had happened uh, when she went to Arcadia. Um, also, in this episode, we see Dioza uh, regurg- regurgitating a lot of history that we've come to know about Sky Crew, about how the 100% down to the ground, about how, um, uh, like, like that, a bunch of other history key moments that happened within Sky Crew. Also, the fact that she knew that Echo was a spy. Don't know how Dioza even knew about this. Was she learning this from other defectors as she answers them? Did Kane give her all this information or something? Because uh, it's definitely not in some database or anything. So that was something there. Also, um, Shaw, um, or Zeke as I called him previously, but um, Shaw shared with Raven about how Allegis had abandoned 300 of its uh, pr- prisoners who are now down on the ground when the thing that they were mining, it was some type of fuel, was causing them to get sick. So uh, Allegis was kind of like abandoned, abandoned the workers. When Shaw didn't approve of this order, he short circuited the shock collars on the prisoners, which allowed them to overthrow the religious, religious crew that wanted to leave them behind. Uh, so there's that. This was also um, one of the sneak peeks that were released before the episode aired. Um, so if you wanted to check back on that. Also in this episode, we got confirmation from Abby that 75% of the religious prisoners are sick with this mysterious illness that was caused to what they were mining. Don't know to what affects like what's being caused for them to get sick like what exactly is being affected um but it's definitely uh terminal from the looks of it or from the sounds of it so there's that so moving on to ship status um uh we do see more scenes with clark and monty um definitely got some uh old vibes back to season one season two between them um we also saw more uh more scenes with bellamy and monty not only them reminiscing about their time on the ring but also just being there for each other in a way or um which also not only reminisces this is back to season one but also with season three when it was the two of them trying to figure out if they should follow pike or not type of thing so it reminds me of that we also get bellamy and clark teaming up together as partners when they uh confront um indra about what octavia had planned to do with the the breeding experiments so there's that uh we also see a reunion between echo and raven um uh, who are both now prisoners within Allegis. Um, but we got some spy vibes going on when they were telling each other, like, this is Monty's plan, how are we going to do this type of thing? Um, so that was cool. We also have to know that last time they saw each other was in 503, I believe. And also they have been sparring partners before in the past, assuming the last six years. So um, there's that. Also, Kane and Abby we see again, but it looks like Abby picked her pills over Kane because she doesn't automatically respond to his uh, ultimatum about having to pick um, so that's a little troubling there um, also with Raven and Shaw uh, it looks like they're at odds now now with both of them with Shaw colors and him now having lost his loyalty to Dioza when he was founded as a traitor by Echo's uh, uh, workings of trying to gain Dioza's trust so there's that moving on though the most shocking moment of the episode first one I'd have to say has to be the return of those sand parasites and the fact that Wanku was trying to breed them. Uh, I mean, again, alien vibes for that franchise. Uh, that really grossed me out when it happened and they came across that containment hub. Uh, it grossed me out. I was like, oh, anyways. And then another shocking thing was the fact that um, Dioza, when she goes to see Abby for a checkout, which she's refused repeatedly beforehand, it was revealed that Dioza is actually pregnant. So. Um, that was a huge surprise there. I wasn't expecting that. But though it makes sense, though, because she always had that huge vest in front of her. I mean, you couldn't tell that that's one way to cover it, right? So, um, anyways, moving on to top three favorite moments. Uh, First one I have to say would be the um, Clark and Monty scenes, um, especially when it's Clark giving Monty the letter from Jasper. And then just how I'm hiding in that farm and witnessing 
uh, Kara Cooper wheeling in a uh, dead body and then go- them going to investigate and finding out um, that this breeding thing is going on. One off, I love the fact how Monty uh, got through the locked door and then him just showing Clark saying like, you have little faith and it's like, I can do this and him explaining how he did. I love that. First off, Monty can crack through anything for sure. Love him for that. Also, the fact when this whole thing was happening, when they were discovering this like secret within Wonka, it got me huge Mount Weather vibes because as you remember in 113, Clark found she was in this unknown sterile white place and Monty was on the other side of the glass. So it's always been those two. Um, so that's why I got the Mount Weather vibes. Also because Clark pretty much went investigating the exact same way in their early first episodes of season two where she discovered that Mount Weather was uh, was harvesting blood from the grounders and she found the whole um, whole vat and cage and all that and the, the blood dripping, bloodletting and all that, right? So this scene of them discovering the containment uh, hub gave me those same vibes. It brought me back to the time when Clark was in this situation like six years ago and Monty happened to kind of be there in a sense as well too. So I really liked that nostalgic of a, uh, of a revisiting of an old memory for them essentially or that old feeling um, plus it was just great to see a scene with Clark and Monty again I loved their dynamic earlier on in the show when you got to see them having dynamics more with each other and then um, so it's just great to see that being revisited once again so I truly appreciate that uh, another favorite I liked was also seeing Bellamy added to that duo, duo with Bellamy, Clark, and Monty talking about the whole breeding experiment, trying to work out a plan, and then um, bringing Indra into it and how Bellamy and Clark specifically went uh, to talk to Indra. And Clark went because Monty reminded her about kind of the, the strain between Bellamy and Indra after what um, Pike had did in Season 3 um, to Indra's uh, clan. Um so it's great to see that support and that reminder between the three of them. And then also later on when they're in the, that little um, tech room where they're um, waiting for a uh, uh, connection from Raven. How Bellamy, Clark, Monty, and Harper were in the room together. I really like that. I really appreciate that. It's kind of paying homage back to the original 100. I mean, yes, it's a smaller group now, but it's great to see those characters together again, all together again. Um, so I really appreciate that. And another favorite I loved was the reunion between Raven and Echo, more specifically when they had their little spy debrief, um, where Echo's like, come, and you grab a drink, she's pouring a drink, she's pouring the drink, but Raven's kind of on lookout, and then when they switch positions, Raven's grabbing a drink while looking at the little thumb drive while Echo's facing the other way as a lookout. It was just very interesting to see how in sync they worked and how they were kind of on the same wavelength as if as if they've done this a few times before. I mean, Echo has. She's a, a spy. She's done these type of maneuvers before. I mean, theoretically, right? But Raven hasn't. So it was, it was very interesting to get that type of a, a hint to it. I definitely got a little spy feely type of a vibe between the two. So that was awesome. Um, but moving on to top three peeve moments. Uh, one peeve I had was Clark's timing when it when it came to retrieving Maddie. Um it just really annoyed me that Clark went in full view of the arena where Octavia could see her, where the other students could see her. And I think because Octavia saw Clark, that's why she called on Maddie to go into the ring when Gaia knew that she wasn't quote unquote ready um, to be put in the showcase. Um, so it just really bugged me that Clark just kind of didn't stick to the shadows in that sense. So she kind of had her arrival on full view, which which kind of annoyed me so I'll leave it at that another peeve I had was the fact that Abby picked her pills over Kane after so many sacrifices and so many things that Kane has done for Abby it just really sucked that she picked her pills over him I mean he almost died for her and then she promised that she would stop um, if he just if he didn't surrender the way that he did and he still lives so like where is her where is she giving up her addiction she hasn't so it's like uh empty promises from Abby. So it was just a huge disappointment there and it kind of felt bad for Kane when it came to that uh, situation. Uh, but moving on to what will I remember most when I look back on this episode, um, I think the last scene has to be the reminder where Clark has made the decision that um, Octavia needs to be taken out of the picture, whether that is to dethrone her or to kill her, which I hope is not the case, is said to be seen. But the fact that that decision has been made um, is going to be a huge reminder for sure. 
And moving on to random questions, very quickly, first question, if Octavia needs to be overthrown, does that mean Maddie may have to take the flame sooner than we thought? I mean, there has to be a reason why Gaia specifically showed Maddie the flame in this episode. There has to be a connection there. Um, so that's one question there. And another question is, when Gaia told Maddie about her being a Nightblood, meaning she was connected to the First Commander, did it never occur to any of the Grounders or because they didn't understand um, or that knowledge was never passed down to them that if Nightbloods were meant to be descended from um, from uh, the First Commander and there's a time, and then that means all Nightbloods are connected to each other. They are blood related to each other. That's essentially what it means. If you all have the same ancestor, you are all blood related to each other. And then it just, with that being said, that means, it, as you know from Lexa, she said that in order for a commander to be choose, all the, all the night bloods in that class had to fight each other to the death until one was left standing, and that was to the one being named commander. So it's like essentially you're asking these night bloods who are blood related to each other to kill each other off just so that they can gain the crown. That's like the bloodiest royal ascension ever when you're fighting for the crown and it's just did it never occur to them or did it never like how did it get to that point i mean right if they're all nightbloods are going to be related to the first commander that means their ha blood relation had to have been known in that first generation second generation it had to be spread so how far did it get down that line where it was like okay gather all the nightbloods that were found in that one generation and then the last one standing in a kill or be killed scenario will be the one that takes the spot as commander. I mean, like, hello, you're asking me to kill my relative or something. So it's like, did not occur to them. I mean, I can understand as grounders since they're so far from, like, the, the science and everything. But, like, I would assume, like, the first few generations from Becca, the first commander, would have retained some of that information that well i'm related to her so that's family right so anyways i'm rambling moving on to predictions very quickly based off the promo for 508 which will happen next week no hiatus um it looks like kane takes uh Deoza to a trading post and he explains how people share or debate ideas and it's where you realize that um they're also human and how until you realize that until you don't realize, or until you realize that, then all this will be is a battlefield or something like that. It, um, the whole promo was his quote to her. Um, so there's that. So while that's all happening, we see images of someone getting drugged, I think by Bellamy's hands from the looks of it. It looks like Amori pulls a gun on McCreary, who has his hands on another gun. It also looks like Octavia is on a war path. And it looks like someone is unconscious in chains. Um, so there's that. And we also see images of Clark and Bellamy as well. Don't know if it's in the same sequence for those two, but that's what flips through the promo. But based off the synopsis for 508, it reads that Clark's determination to, pr to protect Maddie puts Bellamy in an impossible position. Which is true, because right now Clark is determined to stop Octavia, who, which, is the sole, which is the current threat against Maddie. But in order to stop Octavia, that either is going to... That might cause an even bigger war within one crew, and Bellamy's in the middle because one, Octavia's his sister, but two, if Octavia goes to war and has her way, then Echo, the person he's currently in a relationship with and cares for very deeply, she's going to be in the crossfires when that war gets to um, Shallow Valley with those worm experiments, right? So it's a, yeah, he's a bit of a, bit of a, of a pickle there. Um, but that's about it. So what'd you guys think of the episode? What'd you guys like about it? What do you think is going to happen next? Let me know in the comments down below. Love to hear your thoughts, theories, and predictions about what you think is going to happen next. Also, don't forget to like this video, subscribe to my channel, check out my other videos if you haven't done so already. Also, if you pick up on any parallels that I might have missed, I would love to hear about it in the comments as well. I love those, um, little, um, homages to past events and stuff like that, um, how it ties in. So it shows real planning, I think. Anyways, um, what about that? Um, also, um, Tumblr link down below. I think I mentioned that. I'm already forgetting. But also, my WordPress um, account, the link for that is down below. Everything I post online is connected to WordPress, but it is a work in progress. I have to get back into editing that. But it is more organized. Just keep that in mind. Um, but I'm pretty sure that's about it. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for your patience. I hope you come back next time to see what I have to say about the next episode. But until then, guys, this is Mel. Wish you all a great day, great week, or wherever you are. Bye for now.